Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the third day of CCN. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have as our opening talk this morning, Danielle Walpert from Cambridge University. Um, although to my selfish pleasure, not, um, won't be, not be at Cambridge University for much uh, longer. He'll be joining us here uh, at the Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia. Um, and with that, um, I'll let Daniel come and uh, share his work with us. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Well, thanks very much. It's really great to be here. This meeting's been an amazing um, fusion of sort of three different topics. Um, because I work on sensory motor control, which is sort of in its infancy compared to some of you vision people, for example, I'm going to try and give you a feel of the diversity of the sort of things we can study. So unlike some of the talks you've heard, which are very focused, I'm going to give you sort of a feel of the different areas of sensory motor control we're interested in. And I'm going to base it on this sort of sensory motor hierarchy, which I would explain more as I go through. But I'm going to start at the bottom and start with sensory motor noise and talk a little bit about Bayesian and optimal control. And then I'm gonna move up to motor learning and particularly structural learning and temporal context. And I'll finish with a little bit of trying to link decision-making and control in terms of active sensing. So one problem the brain has to deal with, and we've heard this many times over this meeting, is uncertainty. And that's particularly true in the control of movement. So it sounds easy. You send a command down, it causes muscles to contract, the state of the arm changes, and you get sensory feedback from the skin, muscles, joints, vision, and so on. And there's some tasks you have to perform. But the problem is these signals are not the beautiful signals we'd really want. Sensory feedback is extremely noisy. If you put your hand under a table and try to localize it on top of the table with your other hand, you can be off by many centimeters. Similarly, motor commands are very noisy. Try to aim for the same point on a dartboard over and over again, and you get a huge amount of variability. And tasks we perform are both ambiguous and variable. That teapot can be full or empty, and it can change with time. It turns out the sensory movement and task noise is so great that effectively society is willing to reward those of us who can reduce the consequences of this sort of noise. So if you're lucky enough to be able to knock a small white ball into a hole hundreds of yards away with a long metal stick, then society is willing to give you hundreds of millions of dollars. But I want to convince you that the brain also goes to quite a lot of work to reduce the bad consequences of this noise. So about a little over 10 years ago, we started thinking, does the brain use Bayesian processing to help? And we've heard a lot about Bayes, so I won't go over this in detail, but the idea is you'll generate beliefs based on data, that's sensory input, and prior knowledge memory. So if you're doing a nice motor task like playing tennis and want to estimate where the ball's going to bounce, you can use sensory evidence data to get your likelihood shown here in this red. But you can also have prior knowledge about where the ball tends to bounce, shown here in green, and you can combine those to generate a posterior shown here. And what we showed is if you apply a prior to a motor task, shown in red, and you look at what best explains subjects' data, they sort of internalize that prior. And there have been plenty of studies showing that to a large degree, but not always perfectly, the sensory motor system represents distributions of tasks, learns statistics, estimates its own sensory uncertainty to get the likelihood, and can combine those in a Bayesian way. And so about 10 or so years ago, people suggested that object perception was Bayesian, we suggested that Bayesian decision theory would be a good way to think about sensory motor control. And people like Josh Tenenbaum and Tom Griffiths said, think about Bayesian models of cognition. But it didn't really stop there. What about other things like attention, I hear you ask? Well, don't worry, there are Bayesian theories of attention. And what about mental disorders? Well, you're all right, because schizophrenia has a Bayesian explanation. And even if you want to work on mirror neurons, you're in luck because of a Bayesian perspective for mirror neurons. So it turns out that Bayes can explain everything, which is great. It must be a very human thing, this Bayes. Well, no, it's not, because owl's behavior and your representation are also predicted by Bayes. But is it just an emergent property of a whole system? Well, that's not the case either, because even the way the axons go down molecular gradients is Bayesian. Now, Bayes has really sort of taken over as a dominant force, and you heard when Wages Mars talked yesterday that if you're not Bayesian, you're not going to be optimal. So it's not surprising that evolution, to some sense, will strive towards Bayesian solutions. But there's a problem. The doubters on the Bayesians say, you can always choose a set of priors to fit your data. Priors are just a fun bunch of free parameters, and if you're free to choose them, you could fit anything you want. So there's an overfitting problem. And the real advantage of the Bayesian approach or having priors is if the priors are general across tasks. They're somehow not task-specific. And there have been remarkably few studies where people have asked, do individual people have different priors, and are the priors they have similar or different across tasks? 
So I'm going to tell you about um, a technique developed with Matthew Lengel, which we call cognitive tomography. And the reason we call it that is as an analogy to real tomography. In real tomography, you take low or one-dimensional measurements, and by inverting some nice equations, you can get a lovely three-dimensional structure of the body or brain out of that. Well, what we're going to do is take low-dimensional measurements and try to reconstruct high-dimensional priors from that. And the way we do that is basically by using advanced machine learning techniques um, with observer models. And the idea, and we're going to apply it to faces just as a, a test bed, is that you could imagine that people have a prior over the structures of faces. So this is from the Basel data set. It's the first two principal components of the structures of faces. And I'm showing you plus or minus four standard deviations in each direction. And you might imagine that people experience different faces over their lives. So you may have some distribution of your prior belief of faces. If I then give you stimuli and ask you to make binary judgments, we can try to infer from these low-dimensional measurements this high-dimensional prior. And the way we do that is we have an observer model which has includes noise and, noise and biases in perception and decision-making, and we use machine learning techniques to basically factor out this component to estimate that. And if you want to know how we do that, there are 26 pages of supplementary material in this paper, which are well worth reading, where we test it on synthetic data and validate the model in a lot of detail. And so we can apply it to a very simple task, familiarity. We show two faces, and we say which one's more familiar. Now, clearly what we're going to expect is the one higher in the prior, and general is going to be more familiar, subject to sensory noise and decision noise. And here, for one subject, is the prior we extract for that subject. And one thing you'll notice, it's highly structured. It's not just a simple Gaussian. If we take a different subject on the same task, again, we get a highly structured prior, but it's different across subjects. But now we can ask the same subject to do a different task. The familiarity task asks people to compare the image to some internal representation of faces, but we have an odd one out task where we show three faces and say which one is the odd one out of the three. Okay? Now they're having to compare the faces to each other, but again, in the observer model, we use this prior, try to extract it, and what you'll see in the odd one out task for these subjects, how similar the priors are across these tasks. And I'll show you our four best subjects, and by best, I don't mean best in terms of these matching each other. I mean in their consistency. We repeat some of the stimuli, and we ask how often do they answer the same way for the same set of stimuli in different places on the screen. And these are the subjects who have the least effect decision and, and sensory noise, so they answer the same way. And you can see they're highly structured and similar. But the proof of the pudding really is can we use the prior fit from one task to predict performance in the other task? And that's shown here. Here is predicted with a task, take half the data, predict the other half, and we do well above chance on the familiarity. But if we take the prior from the odd one out task and use it to predict performance, we do pretty well. And similarly, if we do the other way around, we do equally well whether we take the prior from the same task or other. But you could say we're way off perfect performance, but if we can actually get an upper bound on how well we should be able to do, based on our consistency scores. It tells us how really well we should be able to do, and that's this line here. So we almost do as well as we can by extracting these priors. And that suggests to us that the priors for faces are highly structured, subject-specific, and very predictive of behavior across tasks. And it really suggests in this case that these priors are really general, by a generative model rather than discriminative model. But there's no use doing all these Bayesian things if you're not going to generate some action, because the only output we have in our system, apart from sweating, is through motor control. And so having generated the belief, we have to generate some actions. And one problem we have again is that the motor system is noisy. If you ask people to produce forces with their thumb, finger, wrist, elbow, and you measure the force they produce here as a percentage of the maximum against the variability of that force measured as a standard deviation, you see that the variability tends to scale with the force. We call this signal-dependent noise. The amount of noise goes up, roughly a constant coefficient of variation. Interestingly, bigger muscle groups have less noise in terms of the coefficient of variance being smaller, and that's because you've got more units to average over. So why is that interesting to us? Well, it's interesting because it might potentially offer a solution to why we move the particular way we do. So any task you do could be achieved in infinitely many different ways. So imagine catching this ball. If you choose to intercept it at this point, which is the same as this point, you could move your hand along this path or this path or infinitely many other paths. Why do you choose one over another? Well, if you think about the motor command you might need for a particular muscle, let's say biceps, to generate this movement, that's what you want to do. But because of the noise, you're going to get a noisy version of that with more noise for big commands, less noise for small commands. 
And therefore, you're not going to necessarily end up where you want to be. If you were to replay this from the same starting location with the same desired command, you'll get different noise, you'll get another different movement. And so we can sort of simulate what might happen if to the variability of the hand if you chose to move this way. On the other hand, if you move a different way, you'll have a different sequence of commands, different noise being added, playing through a complex nonlinear system. All bets are off as to what's going to happen. All we can be 100% guaranteed, pretty much, is the distribution of endpoints is going to be different. And so if you move this way, maybe the distribution will look like this. And if I asked you which way would you rather move, I would hope you'd all choose this, because the variability might be smaller. So the idea is, given a sequence of commands, given this sort of noise, it leads to a distribution of possible outcomes in terms of position, velocity, you know, duration, joint angles, and so on. So if we specify what we care about in terms of the distribution of possible outcomes, so the task will say, maybe I want to be minimize my vari variability, maybe I want to maximize my variability if I'm a butterfly trying to escape a predator. If I decide what I care about in terms of statistics here, then I can turn this arrow around and say, what are the optimal sequence of commands which will minimize the bad consequence of this sort of noise? And if you do that, you're able to predict sort of goal-directed movements. Here, a saccadic eye movement shown in black and in red, a bit hard to see, shows the pr optimal profiles of velocity for the eye to minimize variability. Here are arm movements in the plane, the trajectories. Here are the predictions based on minimizing variability and similarly the velocity profiles. So we think this is sort of a biologically plausible underpinning for goal-directed movements. Noise affects task success, and you want to control the statistics by choosing different ways to move. So this is sort of where we were at the end of the 20th century. We believed there was a task which led to a cost, you know, I want to be minimize my variability. A planner would say, here's your desired trajectory. This is the best trajectory to do to minimize it. The controller would try to enact that, generate the motor command, but because of noise here, you might drift off from this desired trajectory, and therefore you'd have some sort of state estimator, which would use sensory feedback and maybe prediction to estimate where you were, and you could compare that to where you wanted to be and use the controller to get yourself back onto that desired trajectory. This idea has largely vanished at the moment from our community. And the reason this idea sort of vanished is the desired trajectory is a sort of slippery thing. First of all, it was very hard. People looked for the neural representation of this desired bell-shaped velocity part profile straight line movement and couldn't find it. But there's a better reason that it shouldn't exist. And that is if you make a movement like this and you get perturbed off, what it says is you should get back onto your desired trajectory. And maybe that's a good idea in this case. But imagine you're reaching out to a long bar, like on an exit door, and now you get perturbed off. There's no reason to correct for that perturbation. You can reach for that um, handle at a different location. And if you choose to intervene, you're going to generate more motor commands, add more noise in, and use up more energy. And so one principle is minimum intervention. Only intervene in ongoing actions if it's going to affect task performance. If you intervene, you're going to basically add more noise in, and you're going to add more effort in. And more than that, if you look at the variability of movement, we only seem to control variability where it actually matters. So this is a nice paper from Todorov's group of reaching around an obstacle to hit a very small target. If you look at the variability of a repeat of movements, it basically increases to the midpoint and only decreases where you need it. So you only control variability where it matters for the task. So at the start of the 21st century, we got rid of this desired trajectory and it was replaced by optimal feedback control. The idea, again, is you have a task which sets a cost up, but the planner doesn't specify any desired trajectory. It specifies the way you should generate commands based on current state, a feedback controller. And so it would tell you the laws, and if you get perturbed off, this would effectively be the optimal way to respond to perturbations. Some perturbations you will respond to if they're task, uh, task relevant, some you won't. And so this has really been primarily developed by M.O. Todorov, which has some quite deep maths in it, but it ties together planning, online control, coordination, effort, and noise. And the dominant two costs, although I'm sure there are many other costs the brain cares about, are accuracy and effort. So if I want to model walking, I could choose to walk so I never, ever trip. I'll use up a lot of effort, but I'll never trip. But in general, we choose to walk in a way which saves energy, and occasionally you trip, so you don't have such great accuracy. When it comes to feeding yourself with a knife and a fork, it seems that energy is much less important than getting the fork into your mouth rather than into your lip. So for different sorts of movement, there are different trade-offs between energy and accuracy. But they generally add them together in this sort of cost function. And that gives you then a time-varying optimal feedback law. And here's an example, again, from Todorov's data, showing you the feedback gains for the positional feedback in blue, 
of velocity feedback in, in uh, uh, green and an activation on the muscle at feedback in red. And this is the optimal things to do to play out as a function of time. And the nice thing about this theory, it gives you really precise predictions which are possibly testable. So some things we've been doing in the lab is trying to measure different sorts of gains during the movement. And I'll give you just one example of how we do that. We have people make reaching movements, and during the reaching movements, we perturb vision of the hand. So they're sort of doing it in virtual reality, and we can jump vision of the hand left or right at different points during the movement. And on the trials in which we do that, not all trials, we use a robot to constrain their hand to a straight line. So they visually jump off, and there's a reflex response to try and get you back onto that sort of line. There's a measure of a reflex, and we can measure that. So we jump to the right, the left, and we can measure the force they generate in this channel. They wiggle about in the channel. But when we jump to the left, they get a rightward force. When we jump to the right, they get a leftward force. And then we can measure the difference in that, and we use this as a proxy for the size of the gain to positional ch um, changes. Because by jumping out, you actually make them further away from the target. And if we plot that now as a function of actually uh, position in the movement, for a short movement, we see the gain goes up a little to the middle and then decreases. For a longer movement, it doesn't depend on where they are in space, but where they are in the movement. Again, it increases to the midpoint and then decreases. So qualitatively, at least, it begins to match this blue line here, which is the positional gain. And more than that, if we jump the target mid-movement, so the task effectively changed, we can ask how quickly do these sorts of gains jump from one to another. And the answer is they re-jump re within about 100 milliseconds. So it seems you can recalculate these optimal gains relatively fast. So what I've really said at the moment is that we think you need to learn some surface, some time-varying surface which tells you the motor command as a function of your state, velocity and position. But because of sensory noise, you can't be quite sure where you are in this position, velocity, space, so you do your Bayesian estimation. And more than that, even if you knew where you are, there's vertical noise on this with bigger noise for big commands and less for small commands. And you do optimal planning to sort of um, uh, reduce the bad consequence of this noise. But not everything is, you know, a can. Cans come in all shapes and sizes. And so you might have to parametrically vary your control policy, effectively, for different sorts of cans. And if you're a good Bayesian, you'd learn this distribution of cans to help you. But then again, not everything is a can in this world, and so there may be very different structures. So when you operate with power tools, you may want a very different input-output relationship for your optimal controller compared to cans. So we think of this as the structure of the task. It's sort of the, you know, the input-output equations governing the task, the parameters are the numbers that go into that equation, so the weights, viscosity, and so on. Now, when we do motor control in the lab, we tend to bring people in and give them some interesting motor learning tasks to do. Now, if you do that, you conflate these two things. There's no way the person can separate structures from parameters on a single task. The only way you can begin to separate these is to see one structure with many parameters or different structures. And so we were interested to know is it the case that effectively motor learning has a structural learning component to it? And so the idea is, you know, once you've ridden a bicycle or two, you can ride any bicycle, even though they're rather different, these bicycles. They may share a common structure, but different parameters. So if we plot here in parameter space, some, if you want a synaptic weights, if you want from high dimensional space, here's where you need to be to ride these three bicycles. What would be very useful to learn is that all bicycles lie on a lower dimensional structure. I'm showing it here as one dimension, but in reality it's a lower dimensional manifold. Because that means you could then explore in a very directed way. So when you come to one bicycle, you've got a privileged superhighway to go quickly from the parameters from one bicycle to another. Okay. So how can we test the idea of structural learning in motor control? Well, we're very lucky that in the lab, many tasks interfere with each other. So if I give you a, a prism, to learn, which deviates your vision, or rotate the mouse in your hand, or I give you a dynamic learning task, such as a robot perturbing you, whatever I give you, you will tend to learn as a function of time. Your error will come down. And if I send you out of the lab for minutes to weeks and brought you back and gave you the same task, you'd remember it. You'd perform really well. But if I gave you the opposite task, so if the vision was deviated to the left, it's now to the right. If the robot pushes you to the left, it now pushes you to the right. You're actually worse than you would have been had you never seen this one. So we see that's anterograde interference. And having learned this opposite task, if I come back minutes to weeks later and give you the first task again, you've forgotten it. So retrograde interference. And you can see why that is. You know, when you go to the blue task, you're far from the red, then you may end up with the red, you're far from the blue. These are just two punctate tasks in some high dimensional space. So a hypothesis is that structural learning could be facilitated by joining these two interfering tasks up along a common structure. So the idea is if we could link these 
as though they're part of a low dimensional structure, maybe we could reduce the interference between these two sorts of tasks. And the way we do that is we use visual rotor rotations in virtual reality, very like rotating a computer mouse in your hand. People perform 800 trials, our control group, with no perturbation, really boring that it's reaching to targets 800 times. We then surprise them with a block of 60 degree rotations to the right, 60 to the left, and 60 to the right. And we see what we expect to see. The error is big, let me introduce it, it comes down over 50 trials. When we go to the opposite one, it's, they're way worse than they had not seen this. And they relearn it, and when they come back, they've forgotten most of this and have to relearn it. But now we want to group, we want to try and engender structural learning. To do that, the 800 trials at the beginning, before we come to these three blocks, we choose a new random rotation from minus 90 to 90 uniformly every eight trials. So the way we think about this is we're experiencing some low dimensional structure of rotations, including minus 60 and plus 60, but getting, extending from minus 90 to 90. So having done that, and it's very frustrating, it's like using your computer mouse where someone rotates it every time you try to point, but we pay them lots of money to sit there and be frustrated. At the end of that, we go to these blocks here, and what we see, within a trial or two, they're down at baseline performance. Now, this group's learned plus 60 much better than our naive group. So when we go to minus 60, they should be further away in space, but very quickly, they adapt down to baseline performance, and again, within a trial or two. Of course, they never know when the, 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 the rotation's going to change. There'll always be a, an error at the beginning, but effectively, pretty much obliterated interference between these two. Now, it's not really a fair comparison. This group's seen vision mirror rotations, and this could be just a non-specific thing. That if I see errors, I get better at responding to errors. And we think that's not the case, because we have another group where we give 800 trials, again with a new to perturbation every eight trials. 10% of those trials, they get plus 60. So lots of experience at this. 10% they get minus 60, lots of experience at this. But the other 80% of perturbations are a combination of a rotation, a shearing, and a scaling. So really horrible vision motor perturbation. So the way we think about it is they get lots of experience here, lots here, but everything else just covers the entire parametric space. There's nothing low dimensional to link these two things up. And what we see in this group is they're no better than our control group. So they're not able to learn it. So we think that structured learning is an important part probably of early life learning. Probably as adults, we know the structures of most things and it's all about parameters. But as children, probably what we're learning is the structures. And that learning structures basically reduces interference and allows you to generalize very quickly between different tasks. Now, I don't want you to think that's the only way you can learn opposing things or two different things. So I want to tell you about some recent work we've done on asking what sort of context can be used to learn opposing force fields. So in this task, we use a robot. Subjects will make a reaching movement, and the robot's going to perturb them in an interesting way. It'll produce a force proportional to the speed of the movement, but at right angles to the direction. So if they make a straight movement, they'll get perturbed to the right, what we call a clockwise field. And then on other trials, we'll give them a counterclockwise field, pushing them to the left. Now, I've shown these in two different positions just to illustrate them, but they're all done at the same point in space. So on every trial, we randomly choose a left or right, and they make a reaching movement. And they know that if this light is on here, they're going to get a rightward force. If this light is on here, they're going to get a leftward force. And then we measure how much they've learned by occasionally doing what we call channel trials. Occasionally, we put them in a channel so it's a mechanical channel generated by the robot, and we can measure the force they produce into the channel as their prediction of what forces they're going to get or going to compensate for. And what I'm showing you here is over the course of about an hour, this is a percent adaptation. Zero means no learning, 100 means full learning. They can't learn anything at all. So cognitively knowing this light tells you the direction of the force field doesn't help you at all to learn these two different force fields. But we can ask subjects to do a rather different thing. We can say instead, of starting from here, they could start from that cue, make a movement into here, and then go through the force field. And if they start from the left-hand one, they'll get a rightward force field. If they start from the right one, they'll get a leftward force field. We counterbalance that in different subjects. And for different groups, we can ask them to wait at this fire point for different amounts of time. So if we ask them to wait for a second here before they go through the force field, they can't learn anything at all. If we ask them to only wait a half a second there, we begin to see learning. If we only wait 150 milliseconds, we get more learning. And if they don't have to wait at all, we really get substantial learning. So it suggests that what you do before the movement, if it's what you do, the movement you make before you go through the force world, can be a strong cue to allow you to separate out two motor memories. So based on the fact that what you do before a movement can affect effectively how you separate out these two memories, we thought, let's do the crazy experiment. Maybe the future of what you're going to do later could also allow you to separate that out. And so we said, 
We'll have a group of subjects and we'll show them this target here and this target here, but they're not allowed to follow through. They just make a movement. And again, this target is predictive of the force they're going to get. And again, they can't learn anything. But a second group are allowed to follow through. They make a movement through the force field and follow through to the target. And the direction of the follow through is predictive of the force field they're going to get. And what we see in this group is we see substantial learning. So it seems that what you're going to do in the future allows you to separate motor memories for now. And that's interesting from our point of view because it might be a partial solution to something which has always bugged me, and that's why we're told to follow through in sport. Um, how can it matter what I do after I've thrown a left, let go of a ball or made contact with a ball? It can't make any difference at all, so why do you have to follow through? Well, if you think about it, if I make a consistent follow through, then I think I'll be activating one motor memory each time. Therefore, if I'm trying to learn to do something, if I do a consistent follow through, I'll be putting it all into one memory. If each time I do a skill, I do a different follow through, for example, if the follow through determines which memory you're putting things into, you'll be distributing the skill across different memories. So it might be beneficial when you're learning a skill to do a consistent follow through. And so we did exactly this experiment. We had people learn now just a single force, so very easy to learn. But one group had to do a consistent follow through, and one did a different follow through on each trial. Of course, the initial movement's always the same. And what we find is the group with a consistent follow through in red learns significantly faster than the group who do an inconsistent follow through. And you can even ask, what's the best follow through you can do? Well, it's going to be the one which is the least variable given this sort of noise. So there might be an optimal follow through as well. So we are decided to ask a question of what is it about the follow through which allowed you to separate these memories? And so this is actually two different groups of subjects run. This is a no follow through group, and this is a follow through group run on a slightly different paradigm. Again, the follow through group can learn. But we can ask, is it just executing the follow through that matters? Okay? So to do that, we have subjects start and they make a movement through a clockwise or a counterclockwise field, and halfway through the movement, we show them the follow through target and they have to follow through. So they make a movement through the force field and follow through. And the question is, can they learn to associate this target now with this force field? And the way we test that is on some trials, we show this target right from the beginning and put them in a channel so we can measure the forces they produce um, and whether they're different. And the answer is they can't learn that. There's absolutely no learning at all when they only execute. But in another group of subjects, we can have them just plan the follow through but never actually make it. So what they do now is they start from here, and here's the follow-through target, and they start the movement through the force field, and halfway through, we turn the follow-through target off, and they have to abort the follow-through and end there. So they never get to make the follow-through when they experience the force, but they experience the follow-through only in the channels when there's nothing to learn. So they do get to follow through. That encourages them to plan it, because they don't know whether it's going to be a follow-through trial or an abort trial. And again, we can measure the forces here. And what we find is just planning the movement is enough to get the full effect. So it seems that in order to separate out motor memories, it's only important that you plan to make a different movement, even if you don't actually make the different movement. So it seems that like recent past and future actions determine the current memory. We know the last 500 milliseconds is important. Probably with the follow through, it's going to be a 500 milliseconds, although we haven't tested that. And we can link this in to some, some, to some Columbia neuroscience, Mark Churchill's work with Krishna Shanoi on recording from motor cortex. So they record from multiple neurons of motor cortex, and they can then do a projection down of that um, activity into a two-dimensional space, which has interesting characteristics. So what they claim is that planning is setting the initial location in this two-dimensional space, for example, um, here. And then when you begin to execute, the sort of dynamic sweeps you around. And if you wait long enough, you end back at the middle. So different movements have different plans. And so our hypothesis is, that what matters for separating motor memories is not the physical state of the body, but the neural state of the system. So in this case, when you make a lead in and then do the go through here and you have different force fields here, it, because you'll have different initial states to generate this movement and this movement, there'll be different neural states for the second part of the movement, allowing you to associate those with different force fields. If, on the other hand, you wait a second here, there's enough time for these neural trajectories to go back to naive and then the second movement becomes a second movement which is identical for both, and the trajectories are the same, and you can't learn them. Similarly, for the follow-through movement, if you plan a follow-through as one entire movement, then you're going to have different initial states to generate them, and therefore the initial part of the movement will have different neural states. So we're trying to believe that what matters is neural states, not the physical states of the body. So let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay. So, until recently, that was sort of my whole world. 
but more recently we've got interest in what's at the bubble that, and that's decisions. And so we have some work trying to understand how decision making and motor control interact. And I'll tell you about one last study on active sensing. So normally we have a very motor centric view of action. You want to achieve a task, but there's another role to movement, and that's to acquire information about the world. You know, we know that our hands and our eyes can be directed at different things, and maybe we want to efficiently gather that information. So in this example, now, here's an animal hidden behind, fur, hidden behind some foliage. And if you want to identify what animal that was, you'd have to make eye movements between these points, and hopefully you want to do it efficiently, because it makes a difference whether you can identify the zebra from the cheetah. So this is really an active sensing problem, that you have gathered some evidence from maybe two patches here. If you're a good Bayesian, you'd use the evidence from these fixations together with your prior over furs to generate a percept, which would be your posterior for a cheetah and a zebra. And then you might have an action, which would be where to look next. And you might want to choose that in an optimal way to basically disambiguate between these two and hopefully choose this point here. And you might see this looks rather stripy, more like a zebra. So there have been previous studies of active sensing, but they've been rather simple ones looking for like latent features. So one of the most famous is Nogemnik and Geisler looking for a hidden target in noise. But we were interested in a different approach. We wanted a task that requires more abstract information gathering, more naturalistic, we hope, where no single location is sufficient. You know, finding the target isn't it. You have to integrate information across the scene. And we have one where foveal vision was important. And in particular, we wanted a method to assess fixation by fixation efficiency, to really ask how efficient are you being, rather than sort of summary things like how many eye movements do you make. And to do that, we're going to use rather simple stimuli with a gaze contingent display. And the way we do that is we generate artificial furs. We have patchy furs and stripy furs. And the task for the subject is to just to say, are they stripy or patchy? There are two sorts of stripy, horizontal and vertical. They don't have to distinguish between them. And the way these are generated are with Gaussian processes. And the beauty of Gaussian processes is you can generate these multiple patches where all the images are different, so no pixel will tell you anything in particular, but they all have the same statistical structure. So here they have equal length scales. Here they have about a three to one length scale. If I show you the full image, it's a trivial task. You can absolutely tell patchy versus stripy. So what we do is we train people up on the full images so they know the statistics, hopefully. And then we do a gaze contingent display. They start with a black screen. They fixate centrally. And wherever they fixate, we reveal a very small Gaussian patch. And then they can make eye movements. And wherever they make an eye movement, we reveal another Gaussian patch. And off they go, and they can make eye movements around. And at some point, between 5 and 25, revealings, we stop revealing anymore. And they have to then make a decision, is it patchy or stripy? And the reason we choose to randomly go between 5 and 25 is to make them greedy. We want them to try and gather information in a greedy way, um, because the mathematics becomes very hard if they know how many saccades they're going to have to make. It makes it a much more harder problem for us to model. So in this case, they make these items. We have two different ways of doing it, which are just technical details. In one case, we allow them to rescan this as much as possible before the decision, so that they can basically, it's not a memory task, but we get very similar results. We don't let them rescan. And then they make a decision. Any idea? Patchy versus stripy? Who thinks this is patchy? Stripy? It's a hard task. So this is patchy. OK? Right. We also do that in a passive way, where now we just choose where to reveal. And they have to just follow around, and they can rescan to see all the things, and we ask them again. So we can compare active search versus passive. So this just shows you comparing random passive revealings, where we just do isotropic random, the fraction correct as a, as a function of revealing number, with random they review hopelessly. When they do free scan where they can choose, they do better. It's still a hard task. By 25 revealings, they're only at 75%. So we generate an observer model to try and explain this data. And our observer model's got um, four parameters. We allow a bias on the length scales. They can misestimate the length scales, one parameter. We have perception noise. So when they see a pixel revealing, we add noise to that. And we allow decision noise. We allow both you know, some stochastic decision and a lapse rate. Okay? And we fit this to this data. In fact, we have other data we fit it to as well, you'll see later. And we can do get a reasonably good job of explaining their performance with this four-parameter model. And that allows us also to estimate the information and bits they're getting as the revealings. This is zero bits means they're at chance, one means they're perfect, and this is the information they could get from those revealings, uh, independent of the sort of decision noise. And we can also look at the distribution of eye movements over the scene. This is the mean eye movements for over all trials, and then this is the difference from the mean when there's an underlying patchy image, horizontal and vertical striping. And as you can see, these are rather different, suggesting they're doing something active. 
active. The underlying image is affecting how they move their eyes. And we can show you that by you know, dividing this into half and showing there's a positive correlation between these sorts of trials and a negative correlation between different trials with different underlying images. OK, but we need a model to basically explain the data and ask about efficiency. So we have a very simple Bayesian active sensor algorithm where we probe positions in the workspace. X1 is a two-dimensional location, and Z is the pixel value um, between blue and red. And after R fixations, we've got a data set of our positions and pixel values. And given that we know the generative model, this Gaussian process, it's relatively simple to work out the posterior probability of the different categories given the data. And then we could imagine that I was going to go to a different location in the scene, X star, and imagine I saw a pixel value, Z star. I could ask, how would that change my belief? Well, it turns out it depends both on my current belief and actually on the entire data set, because you need to know the sort of phase of the Gaussian process. And I can now have an updated um, posterior on my categories if I go to X star and see Z star. What I really care about in this task, when it's sort of a binary task, is the entropy of the distribution. So what I can measure is the entropy of this distribution and my expected entropy of this distribution under my belief at the moment. And what I want that to be is as big as possible. I want to reduce the entropy. So the idea is for every location of space, I can estimate how much I expect the entropy will reduce if I go there. Now, it turns out writing this formula this way is very non-intuitive as to what the algorithm is doing. So I'm going to rewrite that equation in a mathematically identical way, but in a much more intuitive formulation, where now we have the pixel value on the left-hand side. And that's nice. What this says... I want this number to be big. I want this bad score to be big. That's my reduction entropy, which means I want this to be big. And this says, how uncertain am I about that pixel? I want to go somewhere where I'm really uncertain about the pixel location. There's no point going to a location where I know the pixel. So that sort of gives you inhibition of return immediately. But if I just do that, it's not terribly useful. What the second element is, it says I want this number to be small. And this is my uncertainty of what each of my categories will predict. So I want to go somewhere where each hypothesis, stripy versus patchy, predict different things. Okay? I want them to be uncertain. So I want to go somewhere where I don't know the pixel value, but somewhere where each hypothesis makes different predictions about what I'm going to see. So it's a trade-off between those two things. And we can run this algorithm. Here's a simulation. This shows you the underlying image. This After the first fixation, there are lots of points equally good. The Xs show you the best points, and the O shows you where the subject actually went. So although it didn't go anywhere near the optimal location, you can see it's quite high in terms of being high in the BAS score. And in fact, we're at the 90th percentile. And as we carry on, although it diverges from the optimal trajectory through the scene, by using information theory, we can ask, where are we in terms of percentile score in terms of all possible locations you can go? And in general, we're right up on the right-hand side. So you're choosing good locations, at least. So now we can ask, given that we've got a model which tells us the optimal thing to do, could subjects have done better than this? And the answer is yes, they could. Oh, sorry, I'll come on to that. I'll come on to that now. The answer is yes, they could, because if we reveal passively occasions which we think are optimal, they do strikingly better. Okay. So there's some suboptimality in the system which is reducing their performance from the best they could possibly achieve. And this just shows you from our BAS the predictions of the distributions we get, which match reasonably nicely with these. We've got positive correlations within categories and negative correlations um, across categories. So, what's the problem? Why are people suboptimal? Well, there are a few features we haven't included in our um, ideal BAS, and we need to turn it into a non-ideal BAS to match the subjects. First of all, we have to include the inaccurate learning. We fit an observer model. They don't have quite the right priors for the length scales, so we include that into the model. We also need to include the perceptual noise, which we fit to the subjects as well. And more than that, even if they decide they want to go here, we know that saccades are not perfect. There's going to be variability in the saccades, bias and variability. And so we add in motor noise. We actually measure it in our subjects in a remembered saccade task, and we include that. And if we include those components, here's the information from the, from the ideal BAS. We actually reduce the performance of BAS close to the subjects. So it turns out the subjects are about 70% efficient in gathering information. And I think there's a nice technique to, on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, be able to ask how efficient is each eye movement. Now, because I'm a little late in time, I will go on to my last slide. I want to finish by saying um, there's something really important about these sorts of meetings. And since we're at Columbia and there's a new edition of this Principles of Neuroscience in production at the moment, I want to tell you why I do the sort of work I do. I was a medical student back in 1982, 
And at that time, the first edition of Principles of Neuroscience had just come out, and it had 730 pages or so. Now, I can tell you, as a student, that was a lot of pages to have to pretend to read. Um, but in the intervening years, we can ask, how well are we doing producing new principles of neural science? And we can answer that question because there have been four more editions. And the answer is we're doing extremely nicely. The number of principles is increasing at a linear rate. <laughs> so we should be very proud of ourselves as a field for increasing knowledge at this linear rate. Now, we could ask, if I had grandchildren, and my grandchildren went to university, and they read neuroscience, how many pages of principles would they have to read? Well, I'm a modeler, I can do this. R squared 0.96, the answer is about 3,000 pages of principles of neuroscience. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I would argue this is not a good thing. This is not a book of principles. This is a book of all the experiments we can't encapsulate in principles. And uh, it's interesting, we've got physics books. I have to admit, I wanted, a I wanted to get a pot of physics books where we go up and then down. That never happens. They just go up and up. But they're very different in style. They're a principle followed by lots of worked examples, and the worked examples are ever-expanding. So I think it's really the young generation like the students and postdocs here who need to apply pressure. Because when you go to the Society of Neuroscience, you see that 99.9% .9 of people are experimentalists, pushing this curve ever higher. And I don't, I'm not knocking experiments. I do experiments. But it's important that the theoreticians among you begin to apply opposite pressure to this curve so that hopefully over the next 50 years or so, we can push this curve to where it deserves to be a book of principles, not just a book of all the facts. And not do it just for yourself, do it for your grandchildren. <laughs> so I've covered today sort of Bayesian and optimal feedback control, a bit about structural and temporal context, interplay of decision making and control. And this is really a, a big group effort of a lot of people and my funders. And I want to remind you that when you see creatures doing very simple sensory motor tasks, the actual complexity of what's going on inside their brain is really quite dramatic. Thank you very much. The fact that you chose where to go or what to look at or what to examine is an important piece of it. Because if you play a replay of uh, the same set of uh, exemplars to someone who doesn't get to choose, they don't do quite as well. Is there an analogy in this task that you're working on? Um, so, so, no, I, I, well, we didn't do that. So we, we, we know that you can do better if you replay better locations. Um, I think in this task, it's slightly different in that if you let them rescan, I think they'll probably do as well in this task. Um, in the sense, it's a, it's not a, it's, it's a task where we really didn't want the memory component. We really wanted to know about the act of selection process, and we didn't want to corrupt it with them forgetting what the previous things they seen were. So that was quite important to us to allow them to rescan at the end so we get their best estimate. But I, we didn't actually do that experiment. That'd be interesting. Do you want to choose one? Sure. Oh, you need a mic? OK. Uh, <laughs> Shout. I'll repeat. Uh, yeah, I think about for the uh, follow-through experiments. Yeah. That, uh, are you sure that if you just show people the target, people are, are unable to learn the task, unless they're planning to follow through the target, they don't actually do it. Uh, which is fascinating, because in all cases, they sort of have the neural information you know, about that they could use to learn. It would be very good. The sort of forcing the plan to follow through, sort of giving them a strategy for getting yep. that information. That's right. The system, yep. and stuff. I mean, it's true. So in, in, in the group who don't follow through and the targets are there, so we have that queue, they don't even know it's a target. They're just something appearing. They can learn to correlate with it. But, they, but in, th in theory, if they were really smart, they might learn if I try to plan to follow through. But I think it's very hard to plan to follow through if you never actually follow through. So it's really critical in that experiment that we have the trials, many trials where they follow through, but they're always going to channel so there's nothing to learn. And the nice thing about channels is that you get very little decay of memory win a channel, so it's a nice technique. So we had to have those, a lot of those, otherwise we think they won't even bother planning. It's hard to plan if you know you're not going to follow through. I'm not even sure you can do that. Maybe, maybe mental imagery. Okay. So. Um, what are your thoughts on turning some of these tasks into benchmarks for that we uh, I haven't got any thoughts about turning this last one into active learning. I mean, machine, active learning and machine learning is a huge field. I mean, there's lots of people doing optimal experiment design. So this is, I mean, this is rather simple compared to what they do, but what, the, what we're doing here is just asking to what extent humans are, are optimal. Um, but, you know, this is just one way of doing active learning. There's many ways of doing active learning, and once you've got more than two choices, unlike in this, life becomes, then you've got choices to make by what you want to optimize, you know, whether you want to, you know, entropy or success or things or predictive. So David Mackay has got very nice work on that. Yeah. You know, I think 
we should, um, sorry to cut you off, maybe you guys can continue this offline. Thank you again, Daniel. Nope, hold on. Okay.